Hey traders, this is Paul Robinson here at Daily FX. Welcome to this week's session of becoming a better trader, fixing mistakes, working on weaknesses. All right, here we go. How you doing? Good morning, good afternoon. To some of you, I know it's good evening. Uh, before we get started, a uh, couple things. Got to go through risk disclaimers. Hypothetical trading disclaimer. All right. So in the every week we always talk about mistakes that need to be fixed, right? Whether it's or things that need to be worked on. Obviously, that's the whole point of uh, these webinars, becoming a better trader, right? So, uh, but it, it, it's as I as I say, week in and week out, and until I'm blue in the face, uh, everybody wants to focus on. Uh, it seems like everybody just wants to focus on the analysis. Everybody wants to focus on the positives, and and then a lot of times uh, it's just kind of natural for people to continue to, to think about the things that they do well and whatnot uh, and and kind of side sidestep a lot of the stuff that uh, you know, it's really surprising uh, how even a, a couple of small fixes in your trading can make a, a huge difference uh, kind of went in, into it just a little bit last week when I when I was saying that you know if you fix one little thing it can become it can become uh, you know, something that, that starts to spread throughout your trading and and one fix will uh, start to, to fix other things or you'll find it easier than to start fixing other aspects of your trading. And, and we all have stuff that we can clean up, uh, rough edges. And sometimes uh, you know you go through a period where you, you, know, you make more mistakes than in another time. And, and uh, if you're a developing trader, of course, you're going to be making a lot of mistakes. All right, you're gonna be doing all kinds of goofy things, and that's okay. Uh, just as long as you're aware of it, and and uh, you know you have that self-awareness that you're you know, you're making mistakes, and that you're you know at least trying to put in some procedures and whatnot to be able to correct those. So that's you know the stuff that we're gonna talk about today, um, and and then hopefully you know it's funny. And I, 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 you know, I look at the, so we, we do these webinars and we have different ones. Some are on uh, trading candlesticks and some are on chart patterns and some are on trading psychology and, and game plans and stuff like that. And I can tell you, uh, and I think about this, you know, I, I always say that, that we don't put enough into this stuff, right? That it's it's always about the strategy and analysis. And I could just tell you that from the attendance on various topics for webinars, uh, it's it just kind of reiterates that, that everybody wants to not think about their mistakes, not want to work on the stuff that actually is, is what uh, is the most difficult. Uh, and I, I can't stress enough how much, you know, working on this uh, can make all the difference in, in your results. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you guys are here and, and I think it's great for the people that, that show up to these, that, that, you know, that show up to these particular topics and whatnot, because, you know, it tells me that, that, you, you know, you're, you're interested in taking those those steps that are that are necessary um, and of course you know it's also we, we always got to talk about the strategy stuff as well but it's become kind of a I don't want to say an obsession of mine uh, to hammer at home uh, but I guess it's it's kind of become one of those things where I'm really 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 focused on trying to uh, uh, in in my experience it's it you know it has very little to do with uh, it has very little to do with one one uh, piece of analysis versus another. It has everything to do with uh, what you do with it, and, and all the things that we that goes into trading, from risk management to trading psychology and whatnot. So, you know, turning weaknesses into strengths. Uh, we have we all have a lot of them. Uh, and again, if you're newer to this, you're going to have a ton of them. That's okay. 
uh, if you've been doing this for a while, you, know, you likely still have some. I know I have some weaknesses uh, that I that I work on, uh, and and I try not to uh, ignore them. Uh, and then of course there's strengths, and 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 you you also want to play to those strengths. But small fixes can add up to big changes. It can be something very small, uh, and, and we'll get into some of those things that that I see as common mistakes and, and, and some remedies and whatnot. But the one thing I, I want to just stress is that you, know, you all you all have different you know different issues. Uh, while many of them have are are related, a lot of a lot of trading mistakes are the same for everybody. Uh, but not necessarily, uh, and and so uh, you know I, I just want to as we go through this I'm going to name some stuff and <clears throat> well, it pertains to you know a, a broad audience of people but yours could be you know a little different and uh, maybe towards the end uh, we have a little time I'll, you know if you guys if there's something I don't mention and you want to ask me then we'll we'll do a, a short Q and A on it or otherwise we'll you know if if it's uh, I think it's to be too many. We can always do that next week because I kind of like the idea of doing these lessons and then and then letting it kind of soak into your your brains a little bit. And then we have the Q and A's on the off weeks when we don't do the lessons. And then that way you can kind of have time to come back with you know some well thought out questions, which I think make for a uh, uh, it can make for you know better a line of of uh, answers than I can give you as well. Uh, so you know you want to make sure you start slow. Don't overwhelm yourself. One of the key things when you're thinking about these things is you don't want to if you got three or four or five or six different things that are you know kind of a, a drag on your trading. You know don't don't say don't try to fix them all at once. That's the bottom line. Otherwise, what happens is that you overwhelm yourself and then you just become frustrated. And you need to be patient with your progress. You're probably going to start, uh, you know, the way that I've I've seen it, I, I should have did a little graph. Everybody wants progress to be like this, right? They want it to be this nice, you know, nice line, nice 45 degree angle or whatever. Uh, and it, it looks a lot more like this. <laughs> And uh, you, you know you've got to you got to be patient with yourself. Uh, you can't you know you got to be persistent. Uh, trading nobody if anybody tells you that trading is easy then a they either haven't done it or b they're lying uh, or or both. <laughs> um, but the point is is that is that you know trading's difficult uh, you know and and and, and you, you certainly got to be patient. Uh, with your progress because it, it, it's something that you know if you don't frustration will eat away at you and then next thing you know you're you know you're doing all kinds of things that that end up uh you know really just kind of turning you off from the from the game so be patient and obviously the first thing you gotta do is start by listing your your weaknesses and and and, and karen you bring up a good point there uh trying to identify weaknesses in of itself can be a challenge and that is true, and that's you know that's where uh, we'll, we'll get into how to do that, and that's you know obviously the first thing you need to do, uh, and and so it, it starts out with and I didn't put this in here, but self awareness, right, is really really thinking about what you're doing uh, and what's driving your trading results, because if you're if you're not, you'll be surprised. You know, I, I I've gone through this process and I've been surprised by things that I thought were uh, maybe uh, working for me weren't uh, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that that seem to be kind of hidden in plain sight and so it's it's uh, it, it's one of those things where you know a lot of problems are just right there in front of you it's just that we have this like kind of a like a, a mental uh, blinder on if you will uh, I was actually running my hand up and down in front of my eyes, as if you guys could see me. <laughs> uh, I'm sitting here, and nobody can, nobody's watching me, and then I'm running my hands up. And I'm going, "What am I doing, Paul?" See right there, I wasn't even, I wasn't even, I had no self awareness that you guys couldn't see me actually doing that. Uh, but you got to keep good records, uh, journal and review. You know, those are the, the 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 three the three parts that that get you to where you're going to be able to find out. You know a lot about your trading. 
right? Everybody has trade history, uh, you know, whether it's whether it be you know pulling up uh, your broker statements, whether it be uh, listing your trades out in a spreadsheet, which I think is a great idea uh, for a newer trader is to, you know, kind of put out, have a build a spreadsheet you know, that that has some of the basic parameters, like you know, what's the what's the pair that you're getting in, if, you know, you're saying you're buying the euro, and you know, what price are you entering, what's your stop, and what's your target, and you know, what's the logic, real simple stuff, but really kind of putting that stuff to together. Uh, so that you're able to, you know, see, you know, go back and say, okay, you know what, this was what was going on in the market. This is what I was thinking, and this is, you know, this is what I was, I wanted to do, and and you'll start to find patterns. You know, for example, you might start to find that, um, you know, maybe it's something, maybe it is something to do with your your tactics. Maybe you find that, you know, when you find this particular setup. And but but maybe it's going against uh, the broader trend. You know, you're looking at the hourly or the four-hour chart, but then you look at the daily chart and you're like, oh wait a minute, the daily chart. Every time, you know, a lot of times when these trades don't work out, I'm, it's because I'm going against the trend on the daily time frame or something like that. I mean, that's just a quick little strategy example. And so then you might start thinking, well, you know what? Maybe I want to tweak this a little bit. You know, and that's a strategy tweak. Right. And and these are the kind of things that you'll see by by actually knowing and, you know, if you can't remember every trade you made. Right. You won't you won't remember all the little things, but if you start to like kind of lay them side by side. You you will start to see things. Uh, you'll you'll see that maybe you, know, you keep trying to buy or sell breakouts and, and you'll realize that like when you kind of take a step back, you're like, wait, the market's going sideways. And every time the market's really starting to go sideways and I feel like, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm forcing the issue. Uh, you know, what happens with me is that a lot of times when I, I know when I'm about to start going through a bad period of trading because I'll start to feel like I'm forcing things. You know, that's the self-awareness that I have. I start to feel like, ah, oh, boy, you know, it's like I'm getting into a trade. I kind of like it. You know, it's got some of the parameters I need, but it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel quite right. So then I realize, okay, you know what? The next thing you know, I just start cutting my trading size down until eventually I'm not even really doing anything. And I have actually found myself in the last few weeks doing just very little uh, because every time I go to do something, it feels like a force. You know, that's a self-awareness that obviously takes a little time to develop. But, you know, again, it's it's one of those things. It's like, OK, you know what? Uh, and I know based on the market and how it's trading that that it doesn't necessarily fit well within my. So you take a step back. Right. These are things that that obviously took me a long time to to, to figure out. But, you know, there are very uh, specific situations uh that you know you'll you'll find oh when this is when this is happening I don't I don't trade well maybe volatility like goes through the roof and you just find yourself going off the rails watching price action then you know you know maybe you need to step it back you know stuff like that uh, but there's a lot of there's a lot of to be learned in your trade history and and kind of comparing what your winners and your losers and stuff like that what's going on there uh, and again when you whenever there's an issue. Uh, you know, only fix one thing at a time, and, and I kind of just threw that in there because it, it really is important. Because what happens is people list out a bunch of problems uh, that they have with their trading, and and uh, you know maybe one psychology related, you know, has to do a little bit with fear, another one has to do with the strategy uh, issue, maybe another has to do with risk management. Although you know, a lot of these things can kind of tie in together, risk management and fear can tie in together. Uh, that you'll you'll be like, okay, well I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and this differently and and i'm going to do it all tomorrow and then tomorrow comes and you do it and you know it, it, it's a lot it's a lot harder uh you know you just you gotta you gotta prioritize your problems and and i'm going to tell you right now and we'll get to it but if you if you want to know where the very first place to start with any kind of problems you have it's risk management because that's that's the part that keeps you in the game and that's that's really you know one of the most important uh, facets to trading so, uh, and keeping journals, uh, whether it's, you know, you write it out old school uh, in a little notebook uh, or you keep it in some type of uh, journaling app. I actually have a journaling app that's on my phone. That way, if there's anything that ever comes to mind while I'm, uh, you know, away from my desk or, you know, just out and about or whatever, maybe too lazy to, to go and grab the notebook. 
uh, I have a journaling app that that I like, uh, and you know, I just it's easy to just pop something in there real quick, and then and then that's that, and then it can actually be exported and and and, uh, and filed away. But you know, stuff like that, you know, it's good uh, because you know there are times you just be kind of maybe sitting there and you're doing something else. I don't know, eating dinner, watching TV, whatever playing with your kids and you'll your brain will kind of drift off and you'll think of something and you'll want to put it down. But anyways, you know, also I think it's a good idea that, to do on a regular basis to make sure that, you know, if you're, if you're quite active in the market, uh, put something down every day, you know, uh, even if it doesn't take very long, it's not like you have to spend two hours writing, writing out stuff, right? You don't need to spend a long time. You know, you can spend a few minutes and at the very least you do it once a week. You know, if you're a swing trader, you don't take a lot of trades. You know, you're you're very busy. You know, with with your you know your day job or whatever it might be. You know, at least come back and, and spend some time. You know, on the on, on the weekend or something, whenever you have time, Friday afternoon, uh, and and you know, get some stuff down because you'll start to see patterns, right? And and some of it will be you know, you could even be like you know, this week. Had a lot of things going on outside of trading, right? And you put that stuff down, and maybe at the moment it doesn't strike you as being uh, anything super significant, but uh, it, it it will it will uh, you know perhaps become a pattern that you see, and and it's those little patterns. Um, you know, I I know that I I know that there's certain times when you know, certain things are going on that I need to like be more uh, I know that when I like for example if if whatever I've been very busy and and I and I'm kind of feeling a little run down or whatever uh, you know I know that I don't think the clearest so I'm aware of that and I just try to like take a step back you know and and not and 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 you know just really be careful in those times I mean it's it's very important you know and, and one of the things is that uh, you have to be aware of like, you know, what's your, what's your, you know, mental state, you know, if you're, are you, you know, you got something else going on that it's perhaps uh, taking up your, your time and enter, it's a big uh, energy drain, right? And it could be a positive energy drain, but it's, a, it's an energy drain, nonetheless, a distraction. And, and you need to be aware of that kind of stuff, right? Because that's the stuff that, you know, people don't think about, right? And then, and then they think it's you know something completely different. They'll be like, oh well, you know what? It's it's the way the market's moving, or it's like you know just maybe the strategy stinks or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but you actually find patterns. And and at first you may this may sound a little abstract, but you know once you start to do it, you you'll realize that there's something there's some commonalities, right? And it could take a little time, but uh, they're they're certainly they're they're, they're different for everyone. Uh, and and uh, you know I, even someone a while ago and I don't I don't recall uh, I think it's 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 someone in this room uh, maybe you can pop your hand up I, but I, I remember it was starting out during it because it I, I certainly know this one uh, put together a good game plan for the week uh, start the week out very disciplined doing the right things and then by the middle of the end of the week things just kind of like start to fall apart you know, and, and I certainly can understand that because what happens is that you're all disciplined. Everything's like you know, you're fresh coming in off a weekend and you got a good game plan going. And then by Wednesday, you know, maybe you're, you know, things are maybe things are going really well. And all of a sudden, you know, you get overconfident, this and that, and, you know, it, but that's like that's good behavior to, to note. Right. To be like, OK, you know what? And why is it that you come in and you're and you're you're good to go for the first couple of days of the week? and the back half of the week falls apart, you know, it's good to know. Um, you know, I, I, I know that, you know, for example, uh, Tuesday through Thursday tend to be my best days whenever I have uh, positions on or, or times to put positions on. It tend to be my best days. And, and, and Friday, and I have a buddy who's just like, he's like, it's like the lookout day. He's like, look out because, you know, Fridays. And he has a terrible history of, of Fridays. So it's like almost, you know, don't do anything on Fridays. And uh, it's like it just doesn't doesn't work out for me well with uh, a lot of the positions when I put them on and stuff. So, you know, understanding stuff like that, right, it, it's very important because you fix one little thing like that 
it can it, it they, they compound right so it's things to uh uh to, to to kind of figure out as you go but i i think that you know everybody's gonna you know find that they have different some people do well on fridays just put that like some some people do very well uh you know maybe they trade numbers right they trade a lot of the big us numbers stuff like that friday's got those and and so they 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 do well with that you know i have i have another uh former colleague of mine uh used to sit next to me and he would trade the the big numbers fridays were a great day for him which you know sent him off into the weekend happy uh, of course sometimes it didn't work out for him but uh you know oftentimes he, he did very well and he was a you know he was a number trader so you know it, it can it can just depend uh you know in, on on the uh the individual all right so so here's some common ones um could have put this one at the top i guess because this this is a big umbrella it's a big umbrella but i wanted to get a little more specific uh this one is is just like just see it all the time and this is if you notice the first three are risk management related because the first three uh these are ones that i see all the time these are ones that i've struggled with in the past and these are ones that will uh they can make they can make all the difference in the world right too much risk per trade is is you know it's a recipe for disaster uh potentially if you're risking too much uh, and inconsistent position sizing is a recipe for inconsistent results. So, you know, that's we'll, people risk, you know, a half a percent on one trade, three percent on another, this, that, the other. Really big, really small, really big, really small. Win, lose, win, lose. Next thing you know, it's like, oh, I, you know, I had a good run. I made money on 60 percent of my trades, but I'm down money. And, you know, this will be this will show up in your this will show up in your uh, records. Uh, you know, you do after a series of trades, you know, 20, 30 trades, you'll be like, oh, well, you know, and out of 30 trades, I did really well. I actually made money on like 20 of them and uh, 10, had, which is a good, you know, if I made money 20 out of 30 trades, then then you you, you better be up money at that point, right? Because you, you did a good, great job. Like, like that's a really good win-loss ratio. Uh, but then if you, if you lost money, it's like, okay, well, I went through and my average winner was like, 0.5 compared to my average loser. So I was losing a pound and making a half a pound. It's not going to, you know, you're not going to do well, right? You're not going to, that's not going to be a, that's not going to work out too well. Uh, over trading is another one. It's so easy to over trade. It's so easy to, to, to get involved. And, and, you know, it, it, there's one thing that trading does, it tests your patience unless you're a scalper, you know, somebody who flips around intraday stuff, you know, uh, they don't, you only hold it for a few minutes or, or what have you, half an hour, uh, then you, you know you, you may not have trades this day, that day, for a few days, uh, could be longer. Uh, and you know, you're, you're gonna be tempted to maybe uh, take some setups that are of low quality, too many positions, et cetera. Uh, that's another thing. Too, over trading isn't just taking too many trades, it's also having on too many positions. So if you find that, that you get sloppy when you take on more than say three positions, you know, it's something to, to, to note and to be like, okay, I'm gonna stop doing this, right? And that, that's gonna be one of my fixes. Uh, poor risk reward. This is one that, that, like I was saying before, you know, you're, you may be uh, taking on too much risk or you have inconsistent position sizing. Uh, Risk reward, same thing. If you have, you could have a, a really high win percentage, but then your risk reward is very, very poor. Uh, and there are ways to work on it. It's not, you know, there are there are certainly ways to work on it. Uh, this would be a strategy tweak. Uh, but a lot of times, risk reward traders will make money 50, 55 percent of, of their trades, and then they'll they'll still lose money. Well, that's because, you know, again, they're only making a small amount on their winners and they're, you know, losing uh, more on their losers. And and even and I would say a 50 percent win rate is, is good. And if you have a 50 percent win rate, uh, that's good. You know, I, I, I it, it's you know, there's it's this game isn't about win percentage. It's it's about the math between win percentage and your risk reward. 
Uh, this is another one that's very difficult that people have a hard time doing is holding to their predetermined stops and targets, obviously blowing through your stop, which now you can count in. This one is a fourth one related to risk management is going to be a recipe for uh, problems. If you're not sticking to your stop loss, you keep moving that stop loss, you're going to get crushed at some point, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to risk 40 points on this. No, I'm going to risk 60 points, 100, and then you're, and then, and then you're, and then, and then, you know, it, it, it's 120, and then finally you're like, I'm out, and, uh, and then you watch this turn around and go in your favor. You know, you're like, oh, well, I should have held, and it's like, no, you should have been out 80 points ago. Uh, you shouldn't have held. You should have just been out like 80 points ago, and you could have always re-entered. And that's, you know, that's what I always say to people. You can always re-enter, right? You can't, you can't, you can't re-exit uh, where you wanted to and take back those losses, but you can always re-enter a trade. It's always a, you know, keep that in mind. You can always, you can always get back in, but you can't get out back where you wanted to get out. Uh, and targets, you know, that's one, get it some profits and then all of a sudden get all antsy and you're like, oh, I'm up some money. I don't want it to get away from me. And this actually ties in with poor risk reward because uh, what happens is is that you'll you'll get up some money and you'll be like, oh my gosh, you know, I got a I got a profit here. I want to get I don't want it to get away from me. All right. And then you get out and then it goes blowing through your target and then you're all upset. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, and and then as well with stops, you, know, you get in, you'll be like, oh, you know what, my stops down here and the euro, I'm gonna get out uh, 40 points from here down lower, and and then uh, it moves like 20 points against you, and you get out, and then that's when it ends up going, you know, in that situation before where I was saying, well, you know, you should have gotten out at the 40 points and not the 120 points. At this point, you got out at the 20 points, and then it ended up going 100 points in your favor, but you weren't in it. Uh, you know, then the next time you get in, you say, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stick to my stop. And then you get stopped out and then you, you miss the winner and now you caught the loser. And, and so, you know, there's, to me, it's, this is one that's a good idea to, to be kind of binary about to a degree. It's kind of like, okay, this is where I'm getting in. This is where I'm getting out. I really like to trade. I don't really like to trade. You know, if I really like to trade, I'm getting in and then that's, you know, that's it. I'm going to stick to my stop loss. And, and, and if it takes me out, it takes me out. So be it. Uh, you know, it takes that, that takes practice, uh, you know, and, and again, with targets, you know, you gotta be like, okay, look, and I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, as last week I said, one of the little tricks is to, to actually track that, right? Track to see how many times it actually goes to your target. And, uh, once the trade starts working for you, at what point does it usually get to your target if you're right? You know, and, and if you're you know, usually if it gets to a certain point, it's going to go, you know, even further. Right. And that's you can see that by tracking that stuff. That's why this is very this is very important to be able to, to identify these these problems, uh, these things that you need to work on weaknesses uh, overcomplicate. Uh, this is this is a big one. Too many, too many people try to make this into rocket science. It's not rocket science. All right, it's uh, it's not rocket science unless you you implement rocket science, and I can tell you that you don't need to be uh, you know, your strategy doesn't need to be complicated. You don't need to know every single thing that's going on out there. Uh, you, there's only a certain amount of stuff you really need in your strategy in your plan, and everything else just kind of is just more. It's not it's not more is better. It's just more. Uh, so our overcomplication is a really big problem, uh, and what it does is it just causes a lot of uh, paralysis by analysis, uh, a lot of hemming and hawing uh, in your decision-making process, which then ends up leading to doing stuff like getting out before your predetermined stops and targets, right? And then it causes you to overtrade. Because uh, you get in and out, in and out, because you're, you know, you're kind of like, oh, this says this, this says that, and then, you know, because it's too complicated, right? There's too many things going on. You got too many lines on your chart, and they're going in every which direction, uh, and you don't know what's going on. And and you got, you know, you're looking at this news and that news, and this headline came out, and oh, this one's coming out, and and, uh, and oh boy, you know, next thing you know, this this guy says, Paul says that, and, and James Stanley says this, and 
and uh, you know the, you got uh, the BOJ doing this, and and I got a trend line here, and I, you know I don't know, you know at that point then it gets really complicated, and your head could start spinning. So uh, that's that's a that's an issue. Uh, as far as indicators, Roger, I, I don't use indicators personally, but I mean, I would say, you know, you've got a, you've got a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit more, but I mean, you got to keep them, uh, fairly tight in terms of like, you don't want, you don't want a bunch of indicators that do the same thing. Let's just put it that way. Uh, we'll get to a bit more on that. Meaning like, you don't want like three oscillators that all tell you overbought and oversold like that. That's, you know, that's definitely a no, no. Uh, a no trading plan. We talk about this every single week. If you don't have a trading plan, I'm going to drop a link in here. I'm going to drop some links. Uh, and I'm also going to... There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, there we go. I'm going to drop a link in here. It's on trading plans. All right, this is we did this one again uh, last month. We did it like a year before that. Uh, you got to create a trading plan. So we'll we'll get into that, but uh, trading plan is like where it all starts. And that's a webinar. The link I just dropped in there in the general chat box is is all about that. All right, so examine an example of a common mistake and the result from fixing it. Some of this is going to be very obvious to some of you, and some is just going to be obvious probably to most of you anyways, but uh, taking on too much risk, what are the problems that it causes? Well, it causes outsized losses, big drawdowns, maybe even blow up. What do I mean by blow up? That means lose all your money, right, or lose enough of it that, you know, you don't want to trade anymore, and that's job number one is we don't want that to happen, right? So obviously what this does is, it causes a loss of confidence and optimism, and it creates a need to make it back all now, which leads to more mistakes. So what happens is then you do this thing called revenge trading, right? The revenge trade is where uh, you, know, you have some losses, you get frustrated, so you are going to make the market give it back to you. And you're going to make it give it back to you now. <laughs> and then what does the market do? It takes more from you. So what happens is it starts out with too much size and then it becomes some big, you know, fairly sizable losses, which then becomes some even bigger losses. And then they become you getting frustrated and having to make that money back now, which leads to even more losses. And before you know it, you're, you're in a really bad place mentally, uh, financially, uh, you know, hopefully it's just mental, but, uh, you know, that's the, you, you, taking on too much risk is just, just a bad place to be. Uh, and when I say this, when I say taking on too much risk, I mean, you know, r risking an amount that you're not comfortable with, or risking an amount that is going to put you in a position of ruin. Risking, you know, 5% on a trade is probably not a good idea. Uh, you know, risking half a percent, one percent, maybe two percent, something along those lines. It's not gonna like, it's not gonna, it's not. It's gonna take a while for you. You have to have a lot of losses add up, but it's different for everybody. So that's why I don't, I never recommend, uh, never recommend the the size because it's it's different for everybody. But there are certainly levels that get a little to be, you know, regardless of who you are, uh, a little extreme. Uh, another problem that that putting on a too big of a position does. And and this could be where you're like, okay, well, you know, I'm risking only, you know, 1% on this trade. And you could say, well, that's that's responsible, right? Nobody's going to argue with me about this 1% uh, risk that I'm taking on this trade that, you know, I'm going to hold for a week or two or whatever. And uh, you say, yeah, that's fairly reasonable. But for you, it may be too big, right? For you, it may be too big. Uh, and the next thing you know, you're, it, you, it's starting to move against you and then you get out of some of your position and then, you know, you're not sticking to that stop loss and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to get out because it's starting to move against me. I don't want to risk this. Usually it's more than 1%, but I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you guys an example of how, uh, it could be relative to the individual. Uh, and then next thing you, know, you start churning the position, man, I used to do this like crazy, uh, 
when I was trying to put on a lot of a lot of size, like when I was trying to go through and you know grow up as a trader, so to speak, and put on you know all the size and be like, okay, here we go. This is the moment where it's all going to start working, and then it would start moving against me. I'd be like, oh no 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 no. I don't, I don't really want to be this big because, because if this thing starts to move to this point and then all of a sudden you start to calculate and you're like, wow, I could really, uh, I could really get hurt here. Um, so it causes you to churn positions and don't stick to your stops and target objectives. Even when you have big size on and it's moving in your favor because you're just focused on the P and L, right? You're not focused on the process of trading anymore. You're focused on the P and L. You won't hold to your target. You'll be like, oh, wow, I'm making a lot of money here. Let me just take it off. Meanwhile, it really hasn't done anything. It's just that you got so much size on that you're just – now you're making a lot of money. It's like if you put on enough size, it, it it's like you know, it, it, it kind of – the joke is that if you don't like that market volatility is low, just leverage up, right? Uh, then suddenly volatility will seem pretty high to you. So you know, you, you, make, you make these fear-based mistakes where – you know, too much size and then any market's volatile, right? Even if it's not moving, it's it seems volatile, every little tick. So it can cause you to stop thinking about the process, stop holding to your target and stuff like that. So a, a lot of this, a lot of mistakes stem from here, taking on too much risk. And on, on the flip side, taking too little risk, um, can sometimes it can, you'll be unengaged. You'll just kind of be like, eh, whatever, and psh, throw it on because like, hey, it's nothing, right? So you you kind of gotta find that that middle ground where it kind of keeps you keeps you on your toes, but not so much that you're you know you're you're scurrying around in a circle. All right. So obviously, here's what happens. Here's what happens when you fix. This is what happens when you when you trade with proper size. It's quite obvious, right? You trade with smaller size that you can handle mentally, as I was already saying. What you can handle, what you can handle, what I can handle, and what another person can handle, maybe three different things, right? Here's what's going to happen. You'll have manageable losses, which means you won't blow up. It means you'll be back tomorrow, you'll be back next week, you'll be back next month, etc. And that's, that's, that's primary number one is that you can come back again, right? Your confidence won't get crushed. Once your confidence gets crushed, you're in, a, you're in a world of hurt. So you want to always protect your confidence like your capital, right? And, of course, then you won't be making other silly mistakes that result from uh, the result from you know taking on too much of a position size. You'll reduce or eliminate fear-based mistakes. You won't feel compelled to micromanage. You won't be sitting there looking at every tick and, and freaking out every time it goes up and goes down. You're not going to open your trading platform 65 times a day. You know, I, I think a good app, I just thought of this, a good app, because they have these apps. Actually, it's kind of silly, but in a way, they already have it. There are apps that will track how many times that you look at your phone. And I believe they have ones that will even monitor how many times you check specific apps. I think that would be a good idea. Uh, for somebody who's compulsively looking at their phone uh, everywhere they go to check their positions, uh, maybe you want I, to I, – I think there is one out there. I, I know that there's one that will tell you how many times you've logged into your phone. Um, I did it for Grins. And I'm not really much of a phone checker, but I did it for grins because I read some crazy stats on especially kids these days and how much they open their phone in a day. It was something like like a teenager will open their phone like 250 times in a day. or so. It was something just I was like blown away, just blown away. So I, I got the app and I was like obviously nowhere near that. I was like 230. Uh, but I think it would be I think it would be a good idea. To, uh, to maybe do that if you find that you're compulsively looking at uh, and, and I mean if they had one for your computer and how many times you pull up the charts uh, or pull up your your trading account you know that would be a good one too but uh, you don't when you when you're not when you're not trading with, with with stupid size you're not you don't feel compelled to go and look at your positions every five seconds and all that's gonna do is just burn you out 
It really, it really is. Uh, well, Marcio, I know it's hard to turn it off. It's hard to turn off the machine. I turn it off. I, I told you this. I, I don't have it open when I'm not, I don't have a trade that I'm managing. Meaning like, like I don't, ha if I have put the trade, if I, I may have positions on, but I don't have the, the app. I don't have my platform open, right? Because I'm not doing anything with it. I only open it when I'm going to do something with it. Uh, or it's getting, you know, I get an alert or something like that. And it's like, okay, we're getting, it's getting close to time, but I don't, I don't sit there and, and keep it open and keep minimizing and opening it, minimizing and opening it, minimizing and opening it. Uh, that, that's, but I know a lot of people do that, right? Uh, so you don't micromanage. It's easier to stick to your stop losses and hold winners. Uh, if you're, it, it, you gotta, what, what we're doing here when you trade with good size, normal size, is you're distancing yourself emotionally from the results. And when you do that, you're able to think with more clarity, right? You're not, you don't make silly compulsive mistakes. <sighs> How much do I demo trade? Uh, I don't at all. I mean, that's not, not anymore. I mean, I'm way past my, I'll be honest with you, Ty, I never did. Because it was, we were, the way I started out, it was, uh, it was literally like they just kind of threw you in the fire. And I started on a prop desk and it was, there was no, I think there was a little demo time, like execution to learn the, to learn the system. But uh, I do recommend though, I mean, I, I do recommend that you, you spend a little time on, on demo, but I, I do think that it's important for people to, uh, to put a little, a, you know, demo for a small amount of time, and then, and then I always say, you know, trade with as small amount of capital as you can. That way, it doesn't, you know, because when you first start out, you're going to, you're not gonna, you're not gonna make money. If you do, you, you it's not gonna be sustainable. You're, you're almost certainly to have some losses in the beginning, so you might as well make them really small, right? So it's only responsible uh, on your part to start out very small, but at least even starting out very, really small. You know, after you get the, the the mechanics down on demo, it it it's it kind of then it, it brings in those the the emotional part because what happens is people get on demo, and they're like crushing it and they're like, man, I'm doing great. I got this whole market thing figured out. I don't know what people are talking about with having problems. And then all of a sudden, put a little bit of money in there, and I mean it could be a small amount, it could be like very very small, and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, hang on a second. <laughs> Hang on a second. Why is this thing's going in on? The next thing you know, all the emotional parts come into it, and that's even with a small amount. So, you know, uh, so I, I think it is a good idea though to to kind of you know demo it to get down those mechanics, but don't live there too long because because the reality is is that the trading uh, has got a lot of emotional aspects to it, a lot of mental aspects to it that you will never get out of out of trading on demo. So. But again, you got to be responsible. Do it very small. Do it very small. Um, let's see here. Over trading. All right. So over trading. Let's see here. Actually, that that is actually a, a difficult uh, question, Marcio. The biggest percentage in a year. The biggest percentage in the year, I'm pretty sure, was uh, was a year where I would not be able to tell you what the percentage for the year was because I didn't know what the leverage factor was behind it, and that has something to do with the way that the uh, the, the desk are are set up. That you don't know what the underlying uh, capital is. You can only speculate. Some desks are more leveraged than others. Uh, I could speculate, but it would it it wouldn't do any good. Over trading. Bigger killer than many. So we were just kind of given a, a, an allocation, and you didn't know what the you didn't know what the the leverage was behind it. So I couldn't actually actually tell you what the return on the the capital was. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, over trading. Bigger killer than many realize. So you're paddling along and you're up like yeah. You know, even when you're making money, what people don't realize is that. Uh, is what is what people don't realize is that in this situation you could be having a good run or think you are you're out there you trade and you're up money and then you got but you got all these small little paper cut losses it's like 
that that you know death death by a thousand cuts right uh this is this is this is really something that that i don't think people realize a lot of times they go back and they, this is what happens you look you go and and say you download your your trade uh your trade blotter right uh you download your trade blotter and you look at it and you're like you got all these good trades in there and you got a ton of these trades in there you're like it's just like small loss small loss small loss small loss. now taking small losses is a good thing and and if you're a momentum trader or a breakout trader you may, that may be in fact part of what's going on what you're doing but you may also find that a lot of those small losses are just kind of like silly losses they're just you like taking little stabs here and there not really having any plan uh, those are the kind of small losses that you want to avoid. Small losses where it's like, okay, I'm going to buy when it goes through this level, and if as soon as it if it goes back down below it, I'm going to get out. And you keep doing that, you know, two, three, four times, and then finally you get that winner. That's a different story than if you're just like, oh, let me just throw this on, throw that on, throw this on. Oh, let me get out. Let me add to it. Let me take it off. Add to it. Take it off. And you got all these little, and then you can't actually come up with a good rhyme or reason. You're like, why am I doing this? Like, you, what that's the thing is like later on you'll be like there really wasn't a great tr reason for me to do that. That's something you need to learn from. So, by eliminating many mediocre trades or even worse, they're, well they're just they really have no basis at all. Uh, you become a lot more efficient, right? And that's 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 very important. That is very very important. And remember. You don't and you can't be in every trade or market move, right? Ty, I know what you're going to say. Trades are like buses. There will be another one. <laughs> so I beat you to that one. I know that was coming. <laughs> uh, yes, that's that's processes over outcome. We actually did a webinar a long time ago uh, that was – it's called it was well, it's funny i think it was like the set the first or the second webinar i ever did in this series it was called focusing on the process it was in december of 2016 i think we might uh we might do that one again it was i might do it again but uh, everything we do every week is kind of about that that's what this is about right uh might do one though specifically but that's exactly right process over outcome that's what that's what risk management and trading with good size, you know, proper size is all about is 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 making sure that you're putting yourself in a position where you can focus on the process and not the outcome. Position sizing, poor risk management uh, is really the is is a, a big one for that. So how to stop over trading, how to stop doing stupid trades. Uh, a checklist and a stupid trade, by the way, I don't mean is a loser. Uh, you're going to have a lot of those. I mean, those ones you just shouldn't be putting on. Uh, a lot of good trades end up being losers. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of trades where I'm like, oh, wow, that was a that was a really good setup. Didn't work. That's that's different. Uh, that's not a stupid trade. That's a really good trade. And then there'll be times where you slap something on, you make money and you could say, well, that was a really, that was not a good trade, right? Even though you made money. So that's another good point. Don't define your winners and losers. Uh, don't don't define good and bad trades by their P&L behind them. Define them by whether you should have taken them or not. And that whether you should have taken them or not is based on your, your trading plan and what have you. Uh, let's see here. Checklist. Whether it's physical or mental, physical checklist. We've talked about it. We've done the webinars on checklists before. It's a good one to do. Uh, we just did this back in March. Uh, drop a link in here. I think it's a good idea to do one physically in the beginning. Uh, and then when you get more experience, you can do one mentally. You can kind of check off the boxes like, okay, you know what? Uh, trend up, check. Uh, support, check. I'm giving you my mental. Uh, Powerful reversal off of support, check. Uh, target far enough away from my entry and my entry far enough away from my stop that it's good risk reward, check. All right, I'm in. You know what I mean? Something like that. Uh, and that, that process kind of goes on like, you know, it's just like 
if you're trading on a slower time frame, trading on dailies, four hours, whatever, that that process is kind of going on for it could be going on for two or three or four days. Uh, but you already know what you're doing, right? Uh, it keeps you honest. It keeps you away from low quality trades, right? So very important. Poor risk reward. We talked about this, uh, kind of going over it again. Poor risk reward. All right. Let me just give you guys, because I was like, let me. What, what's going to be an actual example of how you can improve your risk reward? And we'll look at it here in one second. Uh, but this, but having poor risk reward means you got to be right all the time. So like, it's like if you go to the, if you play, you know, let's say, you, know, you, you uh, I don't know. You bet on a sporting event, right? Your payout, right, is going to be if, if you take the odds, you know, it's going to be it's going to be the same as what you you uh, you bet. Except when you lose, you're going to lose also uh, on the vig that's charged by you know the the bookie, right? So if you're doing that, uh, you're going to you're actually going to end up having less than a one to one. It's kind of like a transaction cost, right? So you're going to end up having less than one to one, which means you got to be right, you know, quite a bit more than you have to be, than you can be uh, uh, wrong, right? So you want to have good risk rewards. It takes the pressure off having to be right all the time. It's easier to find. Uh, it's easier to find trades that are have good risk reward than it is to find the right trade. Uh, so I, I find it easier to play that game. So how to fix it? How do we fix that? Well, you got to evaluate where you're exiting trades and why. The analysis that gets you in should also get you out, right? You 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 should be using uh, if you're using technical analysis, you're using support, resistance, what have you, whatever it is. You should be using some of the same tools to uh, also get you out. Uh, you know, you, maybe you want to implement a trailing stop strategy. Uh, I'm not going to go into the specifics of some of this stuff because because we just want to get you guys thinking. Um, you know, on on some of these different issues and, and maybe some different possible directions you could look for solutions. Uh, if you're not sticking to targets, track how often the trades go to your target. We we like I said, we briefly talked about that last week. Um, and and you might be quite surprised, right? And I did it I did it before where I found that once once a trade got to a certain so I had a target in mind and once it got almost to a certain point that that almost each time it got to that point, then beyond there uh, the percentage of time that it did get to the target was quite high, right? It was quite high. Now, the what I was going to show you guys uh, is this is one that I'm starting to become high on is uh, dollars are. So dollars are actually I'll just pull up this four hour chart because I was tinkering with this uh, yesterday. Uh, this is something that I'm watching and I'm tracking and I'm saying to myself, all right, well, as you can see from my little thing here, uh, that it, it needs to get down. It needs to get down, uh, down to this 1390 area for me to really start thinking about it from a short perspective. But anyways, the point is, is that my target is, is this low over here if it does. And my stop needs to be sufficiently above. Right, so I have all this support right now. If it gets through there, then then I'm going to be looking at it as a short candidate. And my next, my target is actually the next level of of sizable support. So it's an objective level. Now, as you can see from the ratio here, right there, it's 2.61 from this distance to here, right? From my stop to my entry, from my entry to my my target. So 2.61 is sufficient, and I've also got, I'm using my analysis. If it goes back above these levels, then I want to be out. And if it goes down to uh, towards support, that's where I want to start looking to maybe take it off. So the point is, is that I'm using my analysis, right? Uh, so that's that's what I'm, I, I want you guys to focus on, not necessarily the trade setup. We'll, well, if, if I was doing the webinar tomorrow, uh, we'd talk about this, but, uh, Anyways, the, the the point is is that you know there's there's an objective reason for getting in, getting out, if I'm wrong, and where I would get out. And so you know it's not just oh well I want to make a hundred pips, all those dollars are so this thing 
does its own does its hundred pips in a different way. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that there was an objective reasoning, and that objective reasoning is 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 what you've got to do, right? And uh, and so you saw there was a good risk reward opportunity there. If it doesn't work, that's fine. But at two point six to one, I don't know. You can do the math, but I mean, I don't need to be right. But like I don't know, thirty nine percent of the time or something that that I'd break even, right? So I mean, that's kind of makes it so that I don't need to be right very often, and I'm not. I'm I'm wrong a lot. So and for those of you who come to my webinars, uh, on, on with the analysis, uh, you know that I'm wrong a lot. And I'll be the first to admit it. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's it's very important again uh, that what gets you in also gets you out, right? That you have some kind of uh, strategy there. Uh, yes, that this is being archived. I am recording it. I'm, it'll actually be on the home page for like a week after I think today. It's either gonna go up today or Monday. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be on YouTube as well. Uh, Overcomplicate analysis and process. Keep it simple, stupid. So you don't need to you don't need to have like I said before a thousand different things in your trading. There's not you don't need you don't need it, right? Uh, not everybody uses the same things or the same combination. Somebody before uh, the question earlier was was about <clears throat> excuse me was about uh indicators how many indicators well i mean i i personally don't use indicators uh it was roger roger you asked this question earlier uh it, i don't personally use indicators but you know i don't discourage people from if they if they can find good use in them uh, just like anything i mean there's so many different ways to do this but for example you know you don't you don't want to have like rsi and stochastics and then you know some other you know uh, i don't know i can't i'm trying to think of another overbought oversold uh oscillator i you know i don't think you want to have too many things that are, you don't want to have redundancy so you know you kind of want to have things that that capture different uh, different angles, right? So, for example, you may have like, you know, you may be looking at something for trend. You may be looking at something for support and resistance, or a couple different things for support and resistance. Maybe you use price levels, you use Fibonacci, you use them together, uh, trend lines, uh, you know, stuff like that. Maybe you do some uh, Elliott wave analysis. So you, you put in a little, the, you know, the the Elliott analysis would be a little different than the support and resistance. You know, there's a complementary aspect to it. Uh, perhaps some sentiment analysis in there that you know you don't that doesn't necessarily get captured in the price. So you know you have some things that are a little different, um, and I think that that's you know that's what you kind of want to look for, uh, and you want to look because you want to look for confluence, uh, and so. Uh, you, you and to answer that, <clears throat> so you want to look for confluence, but to answer that, uh, Roger, uh, why is because I mean, I, I'm just a really like just really big on price. I mean, I, I just assume get right to the, the nitty gritty of, of price, uh, and look at it as uh, because that's what that's what basically an, an oscillator or an, an indicators are as a derivative. Of price, right? That, that's, of course, they are. And I, I just assume get right to price and leave it at that. Now, overbought, oversold. You know, I certainly understand the allure. And if I, and if there's one that I had to pick, it would be RSI. And that was the one that I've told you guys before. It was the hardest one for me to get off of. I say get off of, as if it was like an addiction. Uh, but it was very difficult to quit RSI because I had been using it for so long. And the reason I quit it was not because I didn't think that it wasn't, you know, I, I was like, oh, you know, this thing's just terrible. I found that it was it was kind of, it was swaying my decisions uh, at times when I rather would have just stuck with price uh, as being like, okay, if it hits this level, uh, how does the market react? 
as opposed to is RSI oversold or is that diverging stuff like that so I, I just that's the way I did it um, and so that was just kind of the route that I, I eventually uh, went uh, and I look at like the 200 day moving average you know I mean I'll look at some ATRs you know look the volatility to see where things are but not I don't use it you know necessarily the, I don't make a decision off of it um, so you just want to make sure there's confluence it's not redundancy so you don't want to be looking at three different things that tell you the same thing right and so you want to find a core of tools and uh, methodologies and stick with them right keep it simple find a core and run with them and consistency is the most important thing so if you're using something in the same way this is this is this is actually like the most important thing uh, besides keeping it simple is, is consistency right it, it's just doing it and looking at it the same way every single time and it's hard because the market doesn't always present itself the same way every time right but you know if for example if you I, I don't know uh, if you traded if you traded I don't know uh, I'm trying to think of a good example Right off the top of my head, if you traded a head and shoulders, since I trade them, how do you how do you trade the head and shoulders? Do you do you like do you get in as soon as it breaks the neckline? Do you wait for the first pullback? Do you do some combination of them? And uh, I pretty much do it the same way every single time. And there's like a little wiggle room, but like I don't I don't like one time it triggers and then say oh well I don't like it I'm I'm just going to like not do anything here the next time I do something. Uh, you know, I, I make sure that I, I act consistently uh, when I do it. And, and occasionally I, I think that I don't occasionally I make a mistake on that and then I end up like regretting it. But, uh, you know, just make sure that, you know, when you look at something, don't be jumping around, you know, using this moving average input and then this one and that one don't change your rsi from 14 to 12 to 15 to 10 to you know and go all over the place be consistent uh you know whatever you do the most important thing is that you're consistent and uniform about how you do something and and if it's if it's working then obviously you know it's working but if it's not if you're not uniform you're never going to be able to identify the problem and you're not going to be able to fix the mistake if you're all over the place with your you know, with how you do things, you know you're going to have your results are going to be inconsistent, and you're not going to have a pattern that you're going to be able to rely on to be able to make any fixes. But if you're consistently doing something and it's not working, then you can you can correctly say that this is not working. But if you're doing it ten different ways, you can't really you can't really say which what, what's right and wrong. Um, yeah, you got to have a, yeah, so like head and shoulders, you got to have a big bearish bar and a bearish head and shoulders, nice big close through it. And actually, I'll, I'll, since I'm talking about it, and since we almost had one, and this was like so close that you could split hairs, uh, and it's funny because this is kind of doing what I, it's kind of doing a little bit what I was thinking could happen, but hopefully it would happen a little lower. But anyways, I, I need to close below, right? I really wanted to, as I was talking about, to close below the neckline, nice firm bar. It didn't. It actually closed like, it was a couple pips above, but it was also above this 200 day, which I was looking at it because it's so close to close below. We almost did. We did, and we closed right on it, right? We closed right on it. So I, even though we were through the neckline, uh, this was my final support level. And whenever there's a support level like this, even though there's a neckline break, uh, I, I always wait for that to get broken as well. So we didn't get the break there. And then we got the pop and then we we're getting the reverse. This is becoming kind of interesting because I was actually hoping we get the break down here. Then we get one of these pop and reverses. So it's kind of funny it's happening, but it's happening from a different area. But the point is, is that it, it still held that support level. So I, I was like, okay, I'm not going to get in until that happens. And we did not get that. So that's, that's where I needed to see uh, that happen. Um, and, and so, you know, again, didn't get in cause we don't have that trade quite there yet. Did break the neckline though. Just didn't break the bottom of the pattern. And that's the tricky part about these sometimes.
So I, I wait for the most amount of clearance. That way I'm like, there's no there's no question in my mind. If there's a question mark, it's like when in doubt, stay out, right? That's the that's the adage. When in doubt, stay out. Better off missing it then. And and that's another thing. If you're in doubt, that's a and that's a subjective thing, but that's being consistent. If you're if you're in doubt about something because it's, it hasn't quite gotten to like then you need to react the same way. Whenever you're in doubt, you react that way. You'd be like, okay, I'm in doubt. You know what? I'm not going to do something here. You need to find out why you're in doubt. In that case, it was easy for me to understand why I was in doubt. I wasn't doubtful because I'm scared to take the trade. I'm not doubtful because it doesn't have the right criteria uh, other than that that you know closing blood level. It just it's it's it would close right at the level. Just below, it broke the neckline, but it's not enough for me. I'm not going to do anything. Right. So, you know, that's that's a subjective portion of this being consistent and saying, okay, you know what, I needed it to close below that because I always need that to happen in those situations, right? Uh, no trading plan. We don't really need to spend too much time on this because we've done whole webinars. I already dropped the link in there. You don't have a trading plan. Too few traders actually have one. Uh, it's amazing how many people don't have one. Uh, if you don't have one, today is a pretty good day to start on one. Uh, doesn't need to be super detailed. Obvious, this is obvious. An obvious fix is just to create one, right? And it needs to include, you know, these basic things: risk management parameters, outline of analysis, decision-making process, favorite trade setups, maybe a couple of examples of some things that you uh, you like to do that that seem to work for you. And if you're newer to this, it's going to take a while. You're going to change your trading plan like 17 times, but eventually you'll start to settle down a little bit to something that sticks. Um, how to handle specific circumstances, drawdowns, periods of success. This one always gets overlooked because this leads to this. Overconfidence leads to this. So you can never abandon uh, and leave that one out. All right. So. I hope you guys, I hope I got your your brains working a little bit today um, by going through all this stuff. I know some of it was, it's kind of like little micro webinars within. We've done, we've covered a lot of the stuff. A lot of the stuff is, is really just the same stuff. It's just, it's, a lot of stuff gets repetitive uh, in, in, in discussing the, the aspects to trading because there's only, you know, there's, there's, you know, you got to have good risk management, right? You got to have good checks and balances and, and a good grasp on your psychology, right? You got to have some kind of, you know, trading plan in terms of analysis and strategies. Like there's not, you know, there's not 75,000 different ways to, to view the, the, the macro portions of your trading. And, but, you know, there's a lot of little nuances in there and there's room for mistakes, and there's a lot of a lot of little mistakes that can be made. I think the ones we covered today are broad stroke, but there's going to be even finer detailed ones in there, uh, depending on what your style of trading is. Uh, but hopefully, I got your guys' brains working in the right direction where you'll be able to uh, to perhaps take some of the uh, stuff that we did today, maybe apply, think about your own stuff, you know, and and kind of. Uh, you know, say to yourself, okay, well, what's going on with my trading? And and uh, if I don't really know, how can I get to figure it out? And like I said before, you gotta, you just gotta be on top of, you know, tracking your trading, journaling, uh, you know, really paying attention to what you're doing and marking it down and looking for those patterns. And then, and then that's where it all starts. So next week we'll be doing a Q and A. Um, and the Q and A, hopefully, you guys. We'll let some of this uh, kind of sink in through the first couple of layers uh, of your heads, and and you'll be able to, to 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 you know maybe maybe come up with some questions pertaining to this. And that next week we'll do a Q and A. You guys can ask whatever you want. Um, but uh, you know, in the next week, try to try to come up with uh, you know think about some of the things that I discussed today, and then and then uh, you know come back with some questions next week and. And, uh, and then I can go into things in a little bit more detail because we're already now at like an hour, what, an hour and 12 minutes. Um, so, yeah, get to work. <laughs> there, there, there's always work to be done. 
uh, little by little. Uh, don't overwhelm yourself. And uh, I'll be, I won't be on tomorrow. We won't be doing analysis uh, tomorrow. I'll be out of the office. So it'll be uh, Tuesday. We'll be back with FX at 9 GMT time. You guys have a good rest of the week. And I will talk to you guys on Tuesday. Have a good one.